presentation is about manage Kubernetes as a next generation academic infrastructure. But first, who we are. I am Lukáš Hitmanek and I am IT architect at Masaryk University and also I am contributing to CESNET, which is a Czech national research and educational network. Hello, my name is Victoria and I am a doctoral student at Masaryk University in Brno, Czech Republic, an IT specialist at Institute of Computer Science at Masaryk University as well. First of all, uh, let me introduce the, the research and educational infrastructure in the Czech Republic. Except a real supercomputing center, we have two main kinds of infrastructure available to scientists. Uh, they are HPC and Kubernetes infrastructure. The HPC uh, infrastructure consists of uh, 32,000 CPU cores. Uh, it has uh, 15 petabytes of uh, storage capacity and it's used by 3,000 active users. Uh, those users are running about uh, 20,000 uh, jobs every day. And we also have uh, 360 GPUs of various kind. Uh, this kind of infra infrastructure is based on uh, PBS Pro batch system. Uh, the other one, Kubernetes infrastructure, uh, it uh, consists of uh, 2,500 CPU scores. Uh, it has uh, 600 uh, terabytes of uh, dedicated storage capacity. It's backed uh, on uh, flash-only storage array. Uh, it's currently used by about uh, 200 users. They are running 1,000 box every day and this infrastructure is equipped by uh, 50 GPUs. Some of them are a NVIDIA A100 and they are yet to be installed and we will experiment with uh, MIG technology as well. Uh, this Kubernetes infrastructure is uh, based on Rancher and RKA you know, distribution. Uh, speaking of managed Kubernetes, so what can you imagine? Basically, it means that uh, DevOps team uh, manage the infrastructure. We offer tight integration with the rest uh, our, of our infrastructure like uh, the HPC. And we aim to offer many components that allow easy deployment of user application. We have, for instance, several storage classes like NFS, Samba, SSHFS or CVMFS. Uh, we also integrated uh, CFFS, uh, but uh, this uh, storage class uh, use, uh, uses a special version of a CFFS driver. Uh, this driver has been patched, so we are able to change uh, user ID and group ID uh, that are locally visible, so it does not matter under which uh, user ID runs uh, the container. Uh, this patch is public as a pull request to SEP upstream, but as far as I know, it's still not merged. Uh, we also have uh, one data class, storage class, and both of these uh, storage classes are implemented as a uh, few CSE drivers. Uh, we have uh, a workaround so that the CSE driver can be restarted without breaking mod point. Next, uh, we have integration of DNS system for uh, ingress and load balancer. It means that uh, DNS name is created for such a service uh, like ingress or uh, the load balancer. We also provide uh, like uh, encrypt certificates for both uh, uh, ingress or uh, also for uh, non-web services. We provide uh, single sign-on service uh, based just on annotation. So if you want to use uh, single sign-on for his or her application, uh, they just need to add uh, some annotation to, to ingress and the single sign-on is regist automatically registered and provided. Uh, we also offer shared uh, GPUs. It means that a single GPU can be shared by uh, multiple containers or multiple users, but there are no guarantees about uh, consumer resources for, from the GPU. And we have also uh, a 
slightly modified GPU operator from NVIDIA that enforce uh, GPU allocation. It means that uh, no user can uh, basically steal uh, the GPU without uh, knowing, letting know the Kubernetes scheduler. Uh, so let's look on uh, manage Kubernetes from user perspective. Uh, users are given project and namespace, and uh, we enforce resource quota on CPU and uh, memory. Uh, the users are allowed to run only unprivileged containers, which can be a bit uh, limiting. But on the other hand, we do not enforce users to use any particular user ID. Uh, users are allowed to use uh, any user ID they want. Uh, users also cannot install custom resource definition or any other cluster scope resources. This, uh, can, this operation are forbidden and only administrator can do so. It means basically a DevOps team has to install such uh, resources. But we want uh, the users to not uh, struggle with uh, maintaining infrastructure, maintaining Kubernetes, maintaining all the compo components that needs to be run. And the user can focus only on own application or own workload and fully utilize the service the DevOps team provide. However, we do not offer just an infrastructure. We go a bit further and we prepare some prefabricated applications such as uh, Jupyter Hub and Binder Hub, as those two are uh, famous and uh, very popular. Uh, also, the Jupyter Hub uh, offers uh, integration with HPC storage systems via H SSHFS. And uh, we also have two special instances of Jupyter Hub. Uh, one is uh, RStudio that uh, runs inside Jupyter Hub, so you can uh, get uh, RStudio on one click that is integrated with uh, HPC storage system. And the other one is AlphaFold on demand. Uh, this application is based on uh, Collabora uh, Jupyter Hub uh, notebook and. Uh, we also integrated Molstar Viewer that uh, allows users to preview the folded uh, protein. Uh, those two applications, the Jupyter Hub and Binder Hub, are run as a web application that uh, has uh, uh, their own uh, logon system. But uh, next to those uh, applications, we uh, prepared uh, another application that are accessible directly in a Rancher as a Rancher application and the, the, those applications uh, mainly contains uh, re, or are based on uh, remote desktops and we offer, offer uh, applications such as Knaim, MATLAB, ANSYS, VMD, Viewer, IBM CPLEX. All these applications are based on either VNC technology and protocol or uh, WebRTC protocol. In the latter case, the user is given a fully 3D accelerated desktop that is uh, pretty capable of almost anything. And also we prepare containers that uh, allow uh, users uh, to use uh, SSH access to this container via network and those containers are running uh, behaves much like a virtual machine because uh, user does not have uh, root access in the, in the container but on the other hand uh, using some say tricks and hacks, uh, the user can install any package or anything in, in this uh, container, so it, should, it behaves much like a virtual machine. Uh, we also offer some web-based applications such as a Coke server or Neo4j, and uh, including uh, other applications such as uh, Personal Minio, Paraview server, Scipion, or Personal Samba server. Uh, those personal servers means that the user can run the Minio or Samba on its own and uh, can connect the local computer to, to the service via S3 or via popular Samba, uh, Samba protocol, uh, for instance, from a Windows system. 
So uh, here you can find some uh, examples of our prefabricated application. On the left top, you can see our studio running in uh, Jupyter Hub. Uh, below you can see the form for uh, alpha fold on demand. You can see that uh, most of the parameters that are used for, for the scripts, standard scripts of uh, alpha fold, you can fill the parameters in. Uh, next to it on the right side down, you can see the Molestar viewer that uh, offers the preview of folded protein. And above um, on the right side top, you can see uh, probably famous game Witcher 2 that uh, runs in the uh, browser and runs from uh, Kubernetes and is uh, fully accelerated. It uses uh, WebRTC and it's based on um, Celtic project. So for a while you can enjoy the gameplay. So now let me reveal some implementation details. First, for remote desktops, uh, our solution is uh, completely unprivileged. Uh, so it means that none of the participating containers need uh, privilege escalation on run as root. Everything runs uh, just on as a, as a user. Uh, however, it required a patched X server. It also required some minor changes to NVIDIA GPU operator. And uh, as I mentioned, we enforce uh, GPU allocation. And this uh, enforcing uh, denies to share GPU among uh, containers. Uh, because uh, NVIDIA visible devices all is ignored if uh, this is the only request for a GPU. Uh, however, we use some GPU uh, sharing uh, from uh, China Alibaba Cloud that is publicly available and uh, with this sharing we can, uh, we can share the GPU uh, between X server container, desktop container and uh, streamer container. Uh, I also mentioned that uh, we offer um, integration with the DNS system. Uh, however, we have no solution for name conflicts. Currently, uh, any user can select any domain name under some specific uh, subdomain. However, this subdomain is shared uh, among all the users, so then can uh, arise some name conflicts and this has currently no solution with uh, external DNS driver. Uh, also with uh, Lex Encrypt certificates, there is uh, one problem with uh, DNS challenge uh, because we offer to get a certificate also for the whole subdomain that is meant for uh, both external DNS and Lex Encrypt certificates. And in this case, all every user is able to uh, get uh, any certificate in, in this domain because there is no real validation of, of uh, the request. And we also are not aware of uh, any any possible solution in, uh, for this problem. Uh, probably one of uh, the solution could be that we can, we create uh, distinct uh, DNS zones for each user or uh, every, every group of user, but this is currently not implemented. Uh, we decided to use Kubernetes also for uh, sensitive data processing. We set up a small cluster that is uh, d dedicated only for sensitive data processing. This cluster is uh, separated from the public cluster. However, the single small cluster is used by all the users that want to uh, process the sensitive data. Uh, we are working on ISO 27000 certification, and which is equivalent to an IST 853 certification. But as I have said, uh, the single cluster is shared by distinct users, which uh, brings some isolation challenges, mainly related to uh, usually single ingress instance and uh, also for uh, STO instance that is uh, not uh, multi-tenant by default. 
Uh, we do not run just few web applications or uh, remote desktops on our uh, in Kubernetes infrastructure. We also use uh, HPC jobs on pretty regular basis. Currently, we run the HPC jobs uh, via uh, workflow managers. We use two of them. One is SnakeMake and the other one is uh, NextFlow. The SnakeMake is integrated with the task execution service from GH4GA initiative and the NextFlow is directly integrated uh, with uh, Kubernetes. So how does uh, the HPC jobs work on uh, Kubernetes? There are some bad rumors that uh, it, will, it does not work, as I have uh, heard, but, uh, we can, but all we can say is that it works. There are of course some limitations that uh, bring some uh, research opportunities. We also create uh, many NextFlow enhancements. The biggest one is uh, adding uh, job, uh, job support, which makes uh, the NextFlow computation almost immortal. So it's uh, pretty stable and it uh, runs just fine. As Lukash already mentioned, there are limitations of HPC in Kubernetes. These limitations are eventually beneficial because they bring research opportunities for the community. There are plenty of areas where research can be conducted, but we started with scheduling challenges because they were the most prominent to us. I would like to present to you some of our research interests, problems we tackle, solutions we found, and new areas we would like to scrutinize. I will talk about four topics. The first is efficient resource allocation in heterogeneous and dynamic environment, which is basically a Kubernetes cluster. The second being infrastructure comparisons of Kubernetes and traditional HPC based on batch scheduling. Third topic will be area of green computing that is with rising electricity prices and global climate status quite an important topic. And fourth and last topic will be about connecting Kubernetes with HPC in a hybrid way. Firstly, I am going to talk about effective resource allocation in Kubernetes. As we all attend HPC Day, I believe majority of you have ever asked, answered, discussed or just came around the question of effective scheduling in any computing environment. Scheduling is an omnipresent topic because everyone tries to come up with the best scheduling strategy that will accommodate the most jobs on all nodes and no job will wait too long and cluster usage will be above 90% with no downtimes. Sadly, this is not the reality and we all experience a plethora of problems. We come from academic environment where computational resources are provided more or less for free for all researchers and academics. This is a very different approach from commercial providers where you can prepay nodes for desired time or follow pay-as-you-use model. When you have a workload to compute, you naturally don't want to pay providers more than necessary, not mentioning if you have specific requests on resources such as graphical cards, whose usage can be really pricey. From the opposite point of view, providers reach very high resource usage because they combine offered plans in a very smart way and efficiently they overcome it very much. Our experience in the academia clearly shows that users drastically overestimate their resource requests. As you can see on the image, even the best uh, use to request ratio for a namespace has a two-time difference. Users lack motivation for precise resource requests um, because, as I said, they are free and secondly, they either don't know how the application works or uh, the resource usage of the workload is not stable over time. However, bursty workloads, as we call the applications with unstable resource usage, are not the only case that makes, that makes scheduling in Kubernetes hard. We distinguish between two types of these bursty jobs. One are long-running services that uh, are used three times a week for two hours, and the second type are computations characterized by dynamic variation when most of the time resource usage is low, but uh, for some short time, perhaps a more complex part of the computation, resource, resource consumption spikes. Users fear their job will exceed allocated resources, which would cause job termination, 
So the reader specifies substantially more resources that then are needed in order to avoid the situation. Second scheduling problem is already mentioned user overestimation, which causes low cluster usage and unused resources. The reason might be just sheer obliviousness to the concept of and logic behind the resource allocation. Third problem is posed by interactive jobs, which are common in HPC, for example, when working with uh, software like MATLAB or ANSYS. If interactive workload is created, user doesn't want to wait until job moves from waiting queue to running for too long. They want to work instantly or in the span of approximately two to three minutes. In Kubernetes, you can set a higher priority on the interactive job, and, uh, but then you must decide which pod can be terminated. Also, you must watch out for already waiting jobs that might require just slightly more resources than your new interactive job, because uh, these interactive jobs could starve others who are already waiting. Lastly, fourth scheduling problem is tied more to the academia where you need to enforce fairness and at the same time account everyone for their resource usage. Kubernetes does not implement any built-in accounting or, fair or user fairness uh, if we talk about uh, multi-tenant clusters, but these are crucial concepts. Imagine that you have a user who spawns uh, too much interactive jobs, and so this user will use all of the resources and new user might never get to compute. The good news is that there are some solutions to the problems. We proposed one possible solution to the need to reserve resources in the, in the manuscript linked below. The solution is based on the existence of small or large, it doesn't matter, jobs that can be evicted easily. Maybe they do checkpoints, maybe their inherent logic counts with restores. Nevertheless, if a larger or an interactive job arrives, these jobs, which we call scavenger jobs, are the first one to terminate and the free space occupied by them is instantly allocated by placeholder jobs that serve just as a reservation. If enough scavenger jobs are terminated to accommodate new workload, all these placeholder jobs free their resources to the workload for which resources were uh, in the first place created or reserved. This is actually uh, one way of implementing forward reservations as we know them from HPC. Another, much easier solution would be to create separate clusters where each cluster is dedicated to accommodating a specific workload type. One more solution is a vertical autoscaler, which should be available from Kubernetes version 125. And the vertical autoscaler is able to scale resources on the running container. This approach might solve a lot of issues when you can change the pod requests on the fly. Now, I will move from effective resource allocation to HPC in Kubernetes. We have been researching the potential of Kubernetes platform to run big workloads, such as analysis on genomics data using a workflow manager. We asked ourselves two questions. Can HPC work in Kubernetes? And will short-living tasks perform better in Kubernetes? We answered those questions by performing several genomic analysis runs on different infrastructures, that being a traditional HPC environment with batch scheduler OpenPBS, and second environment, the Kubernetes cluster. We compared NUMA-aware and non-NUMA-aware Kubernetes environment with NUMA-aware OpenPBS environment. From our observations, we can safely state that for Kubernetes to perform as good and even better as traditional HPC environment, proper NUMA configuration is the most important aspect of the success. We have configured just the standard Kubernetes NUMA settings, so no custom solutions or deep system administration work was needed. We also found out the NUMA Memory Manager has limitations because Kubernetes Scheduler does not see the whole amount of av available memory with each NUMA node. It observes whole state in the cluster. It happened to us that many pods were rejected from the cluster due to unexpected admission error, which is unreco unrecoverable. This error is caused by not enough memory on the NUMA node 
assigned to pod. This truly happened just because the scheduler thought that enough memory was available overall, but uh, the pod was assigned to the specific NUMA node which didn't have the memory. Additionally, the time elapsed from job being scheduled till running job is much shorter in Kubernetes because container images are cached and therefore started almost immediately, whereas in uh, OpenPBS environment there is a bit of the setup uh, which with larger number of jobs significantly delays uh, whole computation. And as a matter of fact, runs in Kubernetes were much more stable overall. On these figures, you can see the graphical interpretation of our results. The upper left picture shows that the average duration of long-running processes of genomics analysis is the highest for non-NUMA aware Kubernetes environment. If we configure NUMA, the time is identical or just slightly more than OpenPBS. On the other side, as the upper right picture shows, if we compare short living tasks, Kubernetes either with NUMA or non-NUMA configuration performs significantly better than OpenPBS. In summary, the bottom image shows total duration of genomics analysis where we clearly see that Kubernetes with NUMA configuration delivers results faster than PBS environment. Uh, this is caused by the combination of the long running processes and short running processes, uh, because there were uh, much more short running processes than long running processes. And if these short processes were computed faster than, than in open PBS, the whole computation was faster. To sum infrastructure comparisons up, we just saw that Kubernetes is certainly capable of accommodating HPC workloads and its performance could improve even more. We found out that Kubernetes scheduler acts almost as a LIFO, last in first out queue, because it does not preserve the queue and the implemented exponential backoff makes just more mess in the queue. Secondly, Kubernetes does not reserve resources, which would be handy for certain workload types, such as uh, ones that re request uh, basically whole, no whole node. Thirdly, low global knowledge of uh, node resource allocations leads to fragmenting memory and CPUs, which could be used more efficiently with a bit smarter or knowledgeable scheduler. And uh, just to mention, this work was all done as a result of a manuscript that is currently under review. And uh, this information marks the end of infrastructure comparisons. And now I will move to the green computing. Green computing is a term that everyone in IT has heard of. Especially these days, we all hear about and really feel the rising price rising prices of electricity and listen to the stories about how not deleting emails adds to the climate change by keeping the servers on. Majority of cluster providers would agree that uh, there are times when huge clusters are just turned on but not utilized or utilized with, re with really low eff effectivity. There is a whole unexplored field of better scheduling strategies that would accommodate workloads with higher efficiency. Furthermore, we as infrastructure providers should educate users on the best way of utilizing the infrastructure and the best environment for their application. A small container can, which will, a small container will be truly better for a static website than uh, starting a whole virtual machine. Moreover, we can tune the hardware based on CPU usage and power on and off the nodes based on true usage. As an idea to work on, we came up with the thought that some cluster nodes could be dedicated to running specific workload types similar to scavenger jobs or short-lived jobs. If there is a sudden spike of the amount of pods of this uh, type, a new node could be dynamically added to the cluster just for these workloads. After these workloads finish, the node could be powered off again. All these steps might look like uh, implementations of just simple thought, yet they have a great power in reducing the power usage and increasing efficiency. Lastly, 
I would like to mention the concept of hybrid cloud that, is, that can be seen as a solution to the scheduling as well. The idea is pretty straightforward and is based on connecting HPC world with Kubernetes world. The HPC world has usually more resources or better scheduling capability and uh, Kubernetes world is perfect for other, let's say, short-lived workload types. We are currently working on uh, implementation of open PBS uh, connector, which would allow moving pods from Kubernetes to the PBS world transparently without modifying the workload inside the pod at all. The container would be executed in the PBS environment as container as well, probably just with more resources not available in the Kubernetes cluster. And with uh, that said, I would like to finish the, this presentation on Kubernetes as uh, next generation academia, academical infrastructure and uh, thank you for your attention.